mile Grand Prix circuit here at Donington. They're all creeping. Now, that's a dodgy start because Alan Carter was creeping across. They'll restart the race. They went before the lights. The lights have now been switched back to red again. Steve, the nerves obviously very tricky at this point. Yes, and it's vitally important to get a good start in these machines. And they are all cleanly away now. Had that have been Speedway, those riders would have been disqualified, but they are given a second chance here in road racing. And a fantastic start there by number two, Alan Carter. So he's away. Alan Carter has a clear track in front of him. He has his tyres nice and warm, so he'll be trying to put some distance between him and the people behind him now. Well, for all we said about Paul Lewis and the damaged heel, Lewis slotted into second place. Number 27, Paul Lewis, is in a good second. But when Carter left the line, he went straight across to the middle of the track, lined himself up for Redgate, and once his nose was in front, well, there was no looking back, so to speak. But they're all threading their way through now up towards McLean's, Alan Carter, then it's Paul Lewis, it's Kevin Mitchell, then it's Nigel Bosworth. So no surprises so far. The top four very much as we would have thought. In fact, the top four just as they were across the grid. Where is Martin Jupp, number four? He was fifth fastest qualifier. We're looking for him now. But Paul Lewis is really going with Alan Carter. And these two now getting away and it's Lewis on the inside. The bike's snaking all over the place. And I'm just wondering whether Alan Carter might be saying, well, you can go, chum. I'm going to sit back and watch it happen. Well, Paul Lewis went in there too quick. He made a mistake. He went in there too hot, ran wide, and was very, very slow through the S's, which enabled Alan Carter to just get on the gas and out accelerate him. So I don't think Alan Carter would have been too pleased with that manoeuvre. It was a pretty dodgy manoeuvre up the inside, hard on the brakes, but uh, out of control. This is... Uh, we're going to see what happened now. Paul Lewis is pulled to the inside, but he's got so late on the brakes, he's charging into the corner. You can see he's trying to straight line the bike. Alan Carter's on the right part of the circuit to take a sweep at the corner. Paul Lewis is having to straight line it because he's on the brakes. He doesn't want to do what Rob Orme did, and he's gone wide. But now he's blocked the track. Alan Carter is unable to get past him on the apex of the right-hander, but uh, he won't be very keen. But now you'll see Alan get on the power and out accelerate Paul Lewis. At the end of lap one, they're on their way now. Alan Carter, the team Honda man, is out in front. Kevin Mitchell has gone past Paul Lewis up into second place. So Kevin Mitchell, formerly from Burton-on-Trent, now living in Preston, Lancashire, on the Med Builders Yamaha, is in second. Kevin Mitchell, who fell so heavily in the Spanish Grand Prix just two weeks ago at Jerez. Last week, I beg your pardon, at Jerez, when in 13th place, was on his way to World Championship points, fell off the thing and wrecked it. So this is the number two bike he's on today, and it's going well. So the Yamaha of Mitchell, every bit as quick as the Honda of Alan Carter. And now Lewis is going with them. So one, two, three, looking for Martin Jupp. In 12th place is Martin Jupp. So not a good start from the Canuck man. Well, Steve, we thought the battle would be between these two, and they've said about it tooth and nail very early into the proceedings. Yeah, Kevin Mitchell closing slightly on the brakes. Paul Lewis, I think he's in pain. He's looking a little erratic. He's trying possibly harder than he is. He's maybe not as fit as he thinks he is. It's one thing uh, being lifted on your bike with a damaged ankle joint, but you need to be 100% fit to ride these machines at this sort of pace. 26-year-old Carter then leads. His burning ambition is to become British and then 250cc world champion. Well, if he rides like this, the British championship will be a formality. Kevin Mitchell is right there with him. The numbers indicate where they finished in the championship last year. And Mitchell riding number eight did not contest all of the Super Cup rounds because he was away on World Grand Prix duty somewhat unsuccessfully on the Chas Mortimer Team Castrol Yamaha. But now... With a new mount under him this year, again, it's one of those V-twin TZs, the, the very next best thing to the factory YZR Yamahas. And as Steve Parrish has said earlier, there are no true factory Yamaha bikes now, so this is probably as quick as you can get. Uh, we have a tumble there, right, a tumble. I didn't get his number, but he looked to be rolling safely out of the way. At the front, then, Carter leads Kevin Mitchell. So these two men now dragging away. Paul Lewis having an admirable ride in third place, bearing in mind the fact he's injured, and he's stretched away a considerable gap over the fourth-place man. 
I think he'll actually be quite surprised that uh, Kevin Mitchell is so close to him. Wolsey Coulter, number three, had moved up to fourth place, and I'm just looking because one of the fallen riders might well have been Wolsey Coulter on the Queen's University Belfast Yamaha. I'll bring that to you, the confirmation of that, as soon as I can, but it looks suspiciously as though Coulter might have gone from the proceedings. But this is the race leader. Wolsey Coulter then has fallen. So there is Wolsey Coulter on his feet, but the bike's not very well. So Coulter was charging up from a lowly grid position up into fourth place, obviously overcooked it, but he's OK, he's on his feet, and back at the front, the pace is fierce. Yeah, Alan Carter with his storming lap time, I think he thought he was probably going to be able to make a break, but Kevin Mitchell is stuck to the back wheel of this bike, and everywhere Alan Carter goes, Kevin Mitchell is there. My heart goes out to Wolsey Coulter because he was in fourth place in the championship after round one at Snetterton and is a very capable rider, would certainly have managed to tack himself on the back of this leading trio. And he was demonstrating that that was on the cards any minute when he slipped off the thing. Alan Carter either has a problem, Alan Carter has slowed. And he's dropped back. I'm not sure what the problem is, but he's dropped back now into third position. Well, there was some sort of signal there from Alan Carter indicating to Kevin Mitchell that he was out of contention. Paul Lewis has now shot through up into that second place. So Kevin Mitchell is in the lead well and truly from Paul Lewis, but Carter is not happy about something. A little bit puzzled as to what that was all about, and I think Kevin Mitchell is a little bit puzzled yeah, as to what it was all I about. I think there's a rider or a motorcycle on the track somewhere, and the riders are expecting the race to be stopped because they're all looking at each other and uh, to, to try and decide what's going on. But at the start and finish line here, there is a green flag, and the race is continuing. So, from Preston in Lancashire, Kevin Mitchell out in front. Paul Lewis had second place given to him because Alan Carter, for some reason, isn't comfortable. Now, whether he's not comfortably mentally with what's going on or whether he has a problem with the bike, but he's certainly got the bit between his teeth again now. Carter needs to get the Honda back past Paul Lewis if he possibly can. And he's gone through. Alan Carter's nipped past Paul Lewis. Yeah, it's quite strange what's going on. Perhaps these two didn't want to lead the race. Maybe Alan Carter thought, well, off you go. And the other fallen rider there that tangled, that is in fact 46. That is Graham Mitchell. That is Kevin Mitchell's brother. There's Woolsey Coulter going across to tend to the injured rider. We'll give you an update on the situation of Graham Mitchell just as soon as we are able to. The race goes on, though, so we can assume from where we are at the moment that the situation is not a serious one otherwise i can assure you the race would have been stopped out in front though it's now alan carter head down right behind him kevin mitchell who may or may not be aware that his brother's now off the bike in third place it's lewis so away they go up towards goddard alan carter leads 86.94 and the lap record round here, and again, maybe I'm not being fair, but I'm comparing it with Grand Prix times. The Grand Prix lap record is held by Luca Cadalora at the British Grand Prix of last year. 92.47, so a good bit off the pace. But then, Steve, these bikes in no way compare with the Works Grand Prix machine. No, unfortunately, they don't. These are very standard machines. We spoke earlier that there is no factory Yamahas around, but there are some special parts that are given to some of the top GP riders, and it does make a considerable difference to the performance of them. But I think that Alan Carter and Kevin Mitchell, they're playing with each other at the moment. I don't think that either one of them is trying 100%, because I believe that they just want to put on a burst at the end, and that nobody really wants to show the other one his hand. Another former there, number 24, that's Tim Cousins. So Tim Cousins walking away, limping a bit, but walking away. They really are tumbling thick and fast here at Donington. It just underlines the strain and the pressure on these 250s. Steve, we can 
maybe take a look at, at Cousins' tumble. Yeah, well, he's come out of the corner. It's a high side situation, and it's exactly what I said, a high side, because the rear wheel slides out from behind him, flicks him around, but he is OK. That's uh, the great thing about runoff areas. He lands in the dust, the bike's broken, but he can walk away. The runoff areas and, of course, the protective clothing which they wear, Steve, very, very high-tech stuff, well covered under the leathers, so surprisingly tough. They can take some really hard knocks without any apparent problem. Mitchell dives for the front again, so Kevin Mitchell is back in the lead. These two then really vying for the honours here at Donington. And Paul Lewis, my hat goes off to him because he's been dragged along in the slipstream and really hasn't given up the pace at all. Lewis is really on the boil. Nigel Bosworth is still in fourth. And number five, Steve Sawford, has moved up into fifth place. Somewhat sensationally, and that we're nearly, well, we're over halfway through the proceedings now, but somewhat sensationally, in seventh place, number 49, Paul Brown, who fell off very heavily in practice, and we thought he had a broken collarbone, wasn't even going to start. He's obviously got the better of that painful exercise. Yeah, there, there was a, a thought that he had broken a collarbone, but I believe it's now maybe just a, a dislocation or something like that. That's even bad bad enough but he's great glad he's out there riding and uh, picking up some points in seventh spot it's a tremendous effort from Paul Brown well third place after the first leg he had to get out there if he possibly could because the points are very very valuable Martin Jupp has fought his way from 10th up to 6th he's now on the leaderboard behind Steve Sawford from Tempsford in Bedfordshire St Neots motorcycle sponsored Sawford who is really only fit today it's taken a while for him to get over an accident he had some weeks ago and he's really now only fighting fit and said that he would really be going for it here at Donington well fifth place is no mean achievement he's behind the very best that UK 250cc national racing has to offer and one of those is the walking wounded Paul Lewis still hanging on very tenaciously in third place and I'm a little surprised that he's managed to stay the pace. Yes, I am also. It's amazing how, uh, how much grit and determination these riders have. Once out on the track, they can only think about gaining another position and finishing that race. Pain doesn't really come into it, which is unlike some other sports. A good day then for Carter. Still right with him, Kevin Mitchell. And Kevin Mitchell is going to have a real go. He is now two-thirds distance. Carter may have the fastest lap at 140.83, but he's charging and taking Kevin Mitchell with him. So by no means has Kevin Mitchell given up the chase. He's there in second, head down, elbows in, snatching the throttle. They're going down two gears up to McLean's. Now the long sprint up towards Coppice. This is the corner where John Kosinski threw the 250 Honda away in the British Grand Prix here last year. A lot of people have gone onto the grass at Coppice when it mattered most of all. In fact, Alan Carter fell off in the Super Cup round just a little bit further down the hill in the wet, exiting the old hairpin. Look at the way Mitchell threads that through there. And which one of them is the better on the brakes down here? Well, I'm not sure if they're going to... Oh, yes, and we just see that answer because Kevin Mitchell goes through, but I still don't think Alan Carter's trying that hard. He's shown what kind of lap times he can do. And I just think that we're going to see some real fireworks in these last couple of laps when we get round to that. I'm very glad, so I've just had confirmation that Graham Mitchell's condition is OK and he's sitting up and waiting for a lift back to the pit. So that's great news about the fallen rider number 46, Graham Mitchell. That is indeed tremendous news, and Kevin Mitchell won't know that, of course, but when he gets back to the pits, he will be told that A, his brother fell off, and B, his brother's OK. So that's good news. It might even be going out on the pit board for him and will inspire him to get past Alan Carter. And there, Graham Mitchell laughing and chuckling. It just illustrates how tough and gritty these people are. Woolsey Coulter with him. So those two, leathers off, ruefully surveying what might have been. They need the points but there are still four rounds to go. Now we're going to see a different story because they're in amongst the back markers. We might see Alan Carter going for it a bit earlier. He might decide that if there's a few back markers around, he can use those as blockages towards Kevin Mitchell and nip, nip through and uh, put some distance between him and Kevin. 
Well, the top six still the same. Martin Jutt grimly hanging on to sixth place, not being able to make any impression really on Steve Sawford. The gap is five seconds between fifth and sixth place, so Martin Jutt will really have to pull out something a little bit fantastic in the last few laps. But these two, it's just 0.3 of a second. In fact, maybe marginally shorter than that, but dynamite is the only word I can use to describe Kevin Mitchell going into there on the brakes. The Melbourne hairpin is where it could all be solved in the final analysis. Could it be, Steve, that Kevin Mitchell keeps trying it down there, knows he's maybe a bit superior on the brakes at the Melbourne hairpin and might just save it there for the last lap? It could be, but I have a suspicious feeling Alan Carter's got his head down. Now, he's popped in the fastest lap of the race or the quickest lap now on lap seven, so here he is. I think he's got his head down and he's going for it. I think we're going to see the laps come down. So they're now on lap ten with two laps remaining. Well, Kevin Mitchell is now seeing Alan Carter disappear ever so slightly away from him, so he's got to squeeze just a little bit more out of the Yamaha. So Honda Lee, Team Silkeline Honda, in the hands of Alan Carter, 26 years of age from Halifax, who is lying second in the championship after the two-leg Snetterton affair. This will mean, if they stay as they are, they will be joint leaders in the championship, the honours even, a win and a second apiece. And it seems to map out for us that the 1991 250cc ACU Shell Super Cup title is going to be very much between these two because they appear to be head and shoulders over the rest. Yeah, very much so. But uh, Kevin Mitchell's not being dropped back at all. He's shadowing Alan Carter. So there is... My uh, prediction that Alan Carter is going for it now, if he is going for it, Kevin Mitchell is also doing the same, and he's shadowing him all the way through. Well, Carter was second in last year's championship, beaten, of course, by teammate Steve Hislop, who is away on European championship duty today. Uh, Hislop sees the European championship as where the opportunities are for him in 1991. He will be doing selected rounds of the British Super Cup series, but Alan Carter is contesting every one and has made it abundantly clear that he wishes to have the number one plate on his Honda for next year. Kevin Mitchell, though, using a wealth of Grand Prix experience, is sitting right up the exhaust pipe of Alan Carter, has him firmly focused and lined up, and Mitchell now is as close and he's attacking as hard as he's been for the last four laps, and that, well, Steve, tells the story. Yeah, Mitchell, there we see it. Mitchell's put in the fastest lap now, so it's toing and froing who's going the quickest. The pace is really hotting up now. The sun sneaking through the clouds here at Donington, making the tyres nice and sticky. The 250cc on the back end, and Carter's gone down. That started with a rear wheel twitch. Alan Carter will be livid with himself for that. That started with the rear wheel twitch. He corrected it, lost the front, and it was all over. Well, I was talking about tyres. I have a suspicious feeling the bike sees. Here we see it. You'll see the rear end lock up first, unless he's just applied too much rear brake. But I have a sus suspicious feeling there was a bike problem. You'll see the rear end slide now. He's maybe got the clutch and he's tried to correct it foot down, but then he's lost the front end. I think the motorcycle sees, and that's what's thrown Alan Carter off, because uh, that would never normally happen going into the corner on a two-stroke machine. What an upset for Alan Carter. His face tells the story. He cannot believe his misfortune. What do I have to do to win the race, he said. And look at this. Kevin Mitchell now, an untroubled win. This is going to be for him. A tail ender ahead of him, but he's got the world really at his feet now here at Donington. He's got to do nothing but just cruise round and keep the gap free because behind him on the last lap is Paul Lewis and Paul Lewis is now some 7.9 seconds adrift. That moves Bosworth, Nigel Bosworth from Stoke Golding, up to third place, and he'll be pleased with that and won't want to do anything silly. Steve Sawford will get fourth. Martin Jupp goes up to fifth. And Paul Brown goes to sixth, and that's 10 points Paul Brown will pick up to add to the 15 he already has. So Paul Brown will move up the total standings. This man, though, is heading for the double. 20 from Snetterton, and it's going to be 20 from Donington. And I bet he can't believe his luck, because we will never know who was going to win this race. There was.
nothing in it. The two guys were riding very, very fast. They were on very well matched machinery. And here it is handed to him on a plate. He's ridden extremely well, but poor Alan Carter, what bad luck he's had. Our commiserations must go to Carter because uh, the race win, if not the second place, was bound to be his. And we really would have been set up for a superb round three at Brands Hatch. And we have a battle for second place, Lewis and Bosworth, it looks like. So it's not all over yet for the Rostrum positions. Here's the race leader then, Kevin Mitchell from Preston, safe in the knowledge that nobody can harm him now. He's heading up the hill. This is the battle for second. It's Paul Lewis, Nigel Bosworth sweeping round the outside, and Bos has got it. Nigel Bosworth from Stoke Golding has squeezed the Yamaha into second place as a triumphant wheelie in the air from Kevin Mitchell over the line. The dash for second, Bosworth gets it from Paul Lewis, a very brave third for Paul Lewis, an equally delighted Kevin Mitchell with the win, but Nigel Bosworth has to be well pleased with second place. But there's your winner, Kevin Mitchell. Hand in the air, the crowd liked that one. They too are a little bit rueful that poor old Alan Carter threw it away with two laps to go. And uh, if we find out that it was indeed a mechanical problem, we'll do our very best to let you know. But confirmation of the result, the top six then, Kevin Mitchell, Nigel Bosworth, a great second, Paul Lewis, a brave third, Steve Sawford, Martin Jupp, and Paul Brown, another tough youngster. Donington Park is probably the most severe test of breaking on the UK circuits anyway. Um, there's no doubt about that. And that was, this is where it will really pay off. Places like the Isle of Man TT, where the braking is not as hard as one would think. And, uh, but it's still nice to have it there, you can feel it there. And the riders have got the confidence, so it does have its effect, yes. In the old days when you just had the two pistons, of course here you've got six pistons, you're creating six pressure points onto the disc. And this, in effect, is three brakes in one. So basically, this machine has got six brakes. We chase the tyre designers, the tyre designers chase us, and so we go on and on. This is where the improvement and development comes from. This is a sintered metal brake pad. We've worked with Kawasaki quite a long time now, and we have a very good relationship, and we help each other develop our own products. Works very well. The increasingly sophisticated world of motorcycle technology. A little insight for you there on the braking equipment. That's the sort of thing they have to use here. And in response, really, to uh, Steve Parrish's reference to Mick Grant and his tyre warmers, I think Mick Grant has been out and spent money on some fairly lavish equipment to keep the front tyre and, indeed, the rear tyre of Jamie Whittam's Suzuki and, indeed, Jamie Whittam himself warm here at Donington. So let's hope that works well for the team Grant Suzuki. The front row, however, fairly good, and Whittam has got to come through from the back. There's Mick Grant. So that was an interesting manoeuvre. I just wonder if it works. Can Whittam get through from the second row down into Redgate? The front row, same as before, Haslam fifth fastest. John Reynolds, who had such a good start and then faded. Terry Reimer, race winner, Mackenzie and Rob McElnay, who also had a less than happy leg one. So the full race distance, 16 laps, 40 miles it is. Ron Haslam, as I said, absolutely bursting to get the Norton to the front and stay there. And I think his tactics may be, Steve, to go for it from the word go. Yes, I would certainly think so. Um, Rob McElnay is out on his spare bike. He had problems. He led the race early at the early stages, or he's very close to leading it with Ron Haslam. But he had some problems, so he switched to his spare bike. So I think we'll see Rob up there a bit more. Neil McKenzie has had a taste of that win. And uh, I think he'll be pushing even harder this time. He's right bang back on form. Well, John Reynolds, of course, will be wanting to get the Team Green Kawasaki in the results. Terry Reimer, the man who had to settle for third place in leg one, is certainly capable of the win, and I think he will be out to prove that he can take it. So the 24-year-old South Londoner aiming to make it quite a special weekend for London. Neil McKenzie from Dunblane, fourth in the World Championship 1990, possibly along with Ron Haslam, one of the most talented riders in the race. And I have to include in that the man on pole position, 
Rob McElnay, number eight. He and Mackenzie known each other, raced against each other for many, many years throughout the British National Series, into Grand Prix together, and now here they are, both back in World Superbike, British Superbike, and Shell ACU 750cc Super Cup. 40 riders then, 16 laps, 40 miles the distance, and the weather holding good. The sun has gone away. We had some sun in the super sports class, but still it's fine. It's very humid. And if they can manage to get the duvet clear from Jamie Whittam Suzuki, hopefully he'll be able to start. I'm convinced that Mick Grant is, uh, has told and convinced Jamie Whittam that he has got a tyre warmer, albeit that it looked like a sleeping blanket to me. Well, it's nice to know that Mick Grant has got a, a sense of humour. But uh, the weaving about there, as we said earlier, really to warm the tyres up. So Jamie Whittam felt that the duvet didn't work, obviously, because he's having to throw it about the tarmac. But they're all doing a little bit. Number five there, James Whittam. Number 10, Roger Burnett. Number 17, in the middle of your picture, Ray Stringer. Matt Llewellyn there from Glenfield, Leicester. We saw Matt, you may remember, at Snetterton riding without a perspex. And he tells us on good authority that on the Monday he could hardly move his neck. It was absolutely stiff with the buffeting from the wind. And we did think at the time, Steve, that he'd have some after effects. Yes, yeah, because he was travelling down the straightaway at Snetterton, which is a very fast circuit, at speeds of excess of 150 miles an hour, near 160 miles an hour, and trying to force yourself through the air without being behind the perspex screen is very, very difficult. It's like, I think we said then, sticking your head out the sunroof on your car doing 160 miles an hour, not that you'd likely to be wanting to do that. James Whittam too, number five, just might have a, a slight advantage. I don't know if it's relevant, but he's just appeared in the 400cc Super Sports and just won the thing. So A, he's going to be fairly pumped up in terms of the adrenaline flowing and B, he will have just a few laps knowledge more of the Donington circuit. Is that relevant? Well, there, there is that side of it, but on the minus factor, the, the 400 is so different. In fact, the 200, 250 Suzuki, is so different to ride than the big 750 four-stroke machine that he's out here on now. It's much, much heavier, this machine. It's much faster, so none of the braking points and none of the acceleration points are going to help him at all. So, no, I, actually, I think it would probably be a... Uh, it, it won't be much help at all. In fact, I think it would be a hindrance. Well, number five, Jamie Whittam is carrying, again, an on-bike camera for us, and uh, I think the technology in that sort of area has improved dramatically and probably cultivated through the Formula One racing car scene to such an extent that the pictures now from mobile cameras are really quite excellent, and we'll be bringing you some of those shots as soon as it's opportune so to do. So reforming then, 40 riders, riders go on the line, for 16 laps of leg two of the 750s. 20 points for the win, not to mention the money. 500 pounds as well goes to the winner of this leg. Across the front row, very quickly, it's Haslam, Reynolds in the middle, it's Terry Reimer. Then number 77, Neil McKenzie, and in pole position, again, Rob McElnay. Exactly the same places as they started the first leg. Look for Ray Stringer, the yellow helmet on the slight left of centre of your picture now. Stringer is a good runner. If he can get a good start through from the second row, and he has indeed got a flying start. Uh, look at Jamie Whittam as well, but Mackenzie and Reynolds vying for the advantage going into Redgate. Matt Llewellyn still in the thick of the action. Tim Board sweeping round. There we have the shot from Jamie Whittam's bike again. It doesn't look like those uh, tyre warmers he used have worked because some of these riders are getting the advantage. I think that's Ray Stringer there that's just passed him as they go down through Craner Curves. And it's, uh, it takes a lot of nerve to throw these machines at over 120 miles an hour through these corners with cold tyres. But Jamie Whittam, he's fighting back. And I think he feels that his tyres are up to temperature and he's charging up behind Ray Stringer. Well, Ray Stringer there, number 17, was indeed just ahead of James Whittam, but race leader, just as it was, a carbon copy of the early stages of leg one. Stringer sweeping wide round the inside. Tim Bourne I saw there, the Team Green, very distinctive, number 33 rider. Tim Bourne, who is back for the first time after four weeks off at Snetterton, he virtually wore one of his toes away. Little toe was quite badly damaged, and he's been 
limping and hobbling all over the place, but he's now fit, or certainly 99% fit, on the Team Green Kawasaki, and he's in the middle of the pack with quite a bit to do. But teammate John Reynolds is out in front, so John Reynolds again, down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Right with him, it's McElney, then it's teammate Terry Reimer, so the two Loctite Yamaha men in second and third. Then it's the Norton of Nation. Haslam is well down the order, it's Trevor Nation in fourth. So it's all change in the Norton camp, Trevor Nation is fourth, Ron Haslam is fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth place at the end of lap one. Yeah, Ron seemed to get a pretty bad start there, but John Reynolds is the man in front. He actually retired from the first race with brake problems. It's ironic, we were talking about this early on, but also Rob McElnay had brake problems. As we heard that uh, Donington Park is extremely tough on brakes, there is so many long straights onto very, very tight corners, and uh, you can get to the stage where the brakes get so hot that the brake fluid can even boil as we talk. Rob McElnay goes in through to the lead, but John Reynolds is having another look back, and Reynolds is on the outside, and that was so close. McElroy being the bigger guy, he said, that's my piece of road and took it. Well, that had me breathing in, Steve, because I thought for a moment there, John Reynolds was going to go on the grass. It looked pretty close to me. Trevor Nation is in the search of a fairly elusive victory. He's, not, he's had some good wins lately, but he's not been able to get his Norton to the front of the Super Cup racing. But he's in a super pace now. He's in a really strong position and challenging in fourth. Then in fifth place, it's Neil McKenzie, but he has to be a dark horse after what we saw him deliver in leg one. Then it's Brian Morrison, number two, but we're with Neil McKenzie just briefly. Ahead of him, it's Nation. Reynolds is still in second. He's the green filling in the Loctite Yamaha bread, but he's right there. Number six, Reynolds closing on the back of McElnay. And whatever Rob McElnay's problem was in leg one, are we going to see a repeat performance? Well, no, because he's on his spare bike. Rob's opted to use his, uh, his second bike, and it seems to be performing well. Terry Rymer's having a look on the inside, because the last thing he wants is his teammate, Rob McElnay, getting too much of a lead, because he'd like to race with him. But it's going to be a tough task to pass John Reynolds. You see Ron Haslam now got up into eighth position, and he's charging. Well, immediately ahead, and look at the action. My goodness me, there's some traffic here. That's Carl Fogarty, number nine, the double world Formula One champion ahead of Ron Haslam. So Carl Fogarty from Blackburn, and we've had a fairly lean time of Carl Fogarty lately, featured well in Super Cup in 89 and 90, but we didn't see him do a lot at Snetterton, and he is now under real pressure from Haslam. Fogarty, Fogarty, whose main ambition really is to be 500cc world champion, had just a little debut in the World Series in 1990 and was less than happy with the bike he rode, so he chose to get back to World F1 and World Superbike. And he's now really under the Haslam hammer because Rocket Ron has got him in his sights. They're coming up under the bridge. Now, this is where the speed of the Norton could tell. Yeah, I think you'll see Ron pass him here. He's uh, on the inside line. Yes, the front wheel lifted as he came under the Dunlop bridge. Haslam has gone through on the inside, and in fact, Ron Haslam is the fastest man on the track at the moment with a lap time of 138.63. So, and Reynolds is going for the lead. The bike, of, I think Rob McElney has a problem again. It looked as though McElney was slowing. McElney almost sat up, Reynolds went through, then Terry Reimer thought, well, you can have the consolation prize, because he went for the win, and Reimer's in front. So Terry Reimer, number one on the bike, number one in the race. Then it's John Reynolds. Trevor Nation is about to have a very serious dig at Rob McElney on the inside. Now watch the Norton go down the straight behind the OW01 Yamaha. It's Nation coming out of the slipstream, down towards Redgate. Sits up, Rob Mack is there, look at McKenzie. No quarter asked, none given here. Nation, yes, McElney must have a problem because they're going past him just too easily, Steve. Yeah, and it's given Terry Reimer the break to go through. He's passed Reynolds at that point, and uh, now he's stretched out three-quarter of a second advantage on lap four, so Terry Reimer will be real keen to get away because he must know that Ron Hassan will be coming through the pack fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven riders, all within 0.8 of a second. And look at McElnay on the inside again of Trevor Nation. So 30-year-old Nation, previously from Salisbury, moved up to Hinckley in Leicester to be near the Norton factory, is really having a super race. There's nothing this big, burly, grinning Wiltshire gentleman likes more than a tooth-and-nail tussle. He really 
enjoys a good race. And he's getting one here, he's back in third. Mackenzie now behind back on, and I think Mackenzie's going to go for it. Mackenzie pulling out of the slipstream, and he's through. Well, I don't know, Steve. Something's puzzling me. Something's not well with Rob McElney, is it? No, I think he maybe has a brake problem again. He seems to be slow on this part of the course, but then we saw him go back past Trevor Nation on the opposite side of the circuit. So it's something that's rearing its ugly head at strange parts of the circuit. Uh, I can't yet work it out myself. Well, something of a paradox there. I can't really understand what it is, but Haslam has come out past Morrison. So Ron Haslam has gone past Brian Morrison, number two. So look at Haslam now. He's right behind McElnay. So Ron Haslam, as Steve Parrish said, certainly the fastest man on the circuit. He's closing now. And very shortly, we're going to be treated to the spectacle of the two Nortons side by side. Mackenzie has gone past. There's Haslam. The next man to fall to Haslam will be Rob McElnay if he continues this rate of progress. Both these men are out on the 1990 Norton. They haven't yet got the 91 bike fully sorted and fully tested. It'll be debuted, I suspect, in the Isle of Man in the hands of Trevor Nation. Haslam isn't going to the Isle of Man. He's not known for his pure road race ability. Nation loves the TT and he can't wait to get his hands on the new Norton there. Yeah, and the speed of the Norton is shown again. There is pass on. Rob McElnay as they went down the start, down the main straight, so he's up into fifth position now. Well, we're focusing on the scrap now between third, fourth and fifth, and it's Neil McKenzie, the 29-year-old Scott, in between the two Norton men. And Haslam is increasing his rate of progress on such a scale that it's only a matter of time, in my opinion, before he goes past McKenzie, and he's going to wait until he gets to a suitably quick part of the track to do it. Rob McElnay is slipping further and further back. The next man to have him is going to be Brian Morrison on the Drambuie Yamaha. But Mackenzie, Nation, and Haslam, number 20. 34 years of age, Ron Haslam from Langley Mill. When he's not racing motorbikes, he's very much a family man. Runs a deer farm, has various other interests but one of the most respected and certainly one of the most talented riders on the British scene, just as this man is. Mackenzie going through, Nation not having any of it. Trevor Nation right with him, this is really close stuff. Yeah, to Neil Mackenzie nipped through, that's his favourite over overtaking place once again. But we look on our monitor, Ron Haslam now again set the fastest lap, but he's going to struggle because it's one thing passing a bike down the straight as he's been doing with the speed, but he's now got the other Norton to pass, so it'll be quite interesting to see how he attacks Trevor Nation. He's going to have to pass him under braking all around the corners because I think the bikes will be very, very similar in speed. Well, the number 20 Norton of Hasler was in 13th place at the end of the first lap, and he's now showing his front wheel to teammate Trevor Nation, and there will be some very basic team orders, which I suspect are, don't whatever you do, bring each other off, and that's about as far as it goes, I would suspect. Yeah, I would suspect that's uh, the only team, and Trevor Nation goes through, passes Neil McKenzie, or he tries to go through, and he does, he's on the inside line, there's nothing that Neil McKenzie can do about that. That might open the door for Ron Haslam, we're going to have to wait and see. We're tending to neglect a stalwart performance by John Reynolds on the Kawasaki, fighting hard in second place, but he's having a nice, quiet second place ride, totally unaware of the frantic scrapping that's going on for third, fourth, fifth and sixth places behind him. So John Reynolds has got to retain his composure and just keep on going, forcing the Team Green bike into what looks like a second place, because I have to say, I don't think anybody could do anything now about Terry Reimer, but just look at this. Mackenzie, it is in third. Then it's Nation. Then it's Haslam. In fact, it's Haslam, and then it's Nation. I beg your pardon, the roles have been reversed, and McElney is getting second wind. Yeah, McElney's fought back, and he's passed Trevor Nation once again. Re Re Terry Reimer has uh, now fought back with the fastest lap. He's down into the 137 bracket, so he's going to take a lot of catching. The winner from last year's series, he wants to show that he can come back to England and prove these boys that he's the best. 750cc, four-cylinder, four-strokes, except the rotary, which is a very special rotating design engine, and unbelievably quick as Haslam goes past Mackenzie again, but Mackenzie's on the inside line, he's not having any of that. 
and this is where this battle's going to go. It raged all the way through the first leg to the flag, and we're getting a repeat performance, except there are two people ahead of them. And look at Haslam, down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Yeah, he took the inside line. Uh, Neil McKenzie will be hard pushed to do anything about that, but what he'll try and do is cut back, keep a tight line, get a good drive out of the loop, and then he might be trying for the inside at Goddard's, but we're going to have to see, comes down. No, Haslam's knees well out in the way. Keep back, he's saying. This is exactly the sort of performance that the British fans have missed from our scene for so many years because these men have been away in Europe for the biggest part of the year and they just haven't come to support the UK tracks or the UK meetings for a variety of reasons. A, because they're riding in Grand Prix and B, because there hasn't been the prestige or the money or any other reason to race in the UK. But with the amount of coverage motorcycle racing is getting on television, the involvement of the big sponsors and the prestige of the Super Cup Series. It's pulled all the big names. The fans are now flocking through the gates like never before. And if motorcycle racing thrills you at home, then that's great stuff. And if you're not a motorcycle fan, then all I can say is you should be. Just look at Haslam. Haslam and Reynolds. And he's got away from Neil McKenzie now. I, I daren't pose the question of Steve Parrish because his man is out in front. Terry Reimer, the Loctite Yamaha man, is out in front. But Haslam's really going for this one. Yeah, John Reynolds is coming under serious threat now from Ron Haslam. I expect Ron Haslam to be moving into second position very, very shortly. Uh, Reynolds is doing a great job and he's riding so well. But Ron Haslam is on the charge. He's on a very fast motorcycle. He loves Donington Park. And uh, he's just using his speed and his ability to, to force his way through the pack. But I don't see there's any way he can catch Terry Reimer. Lap after lap, Terry Reimer's putting the fastest time in. So there's no way I can see it, unless he has a problem that Ron Haslam can get near him. Well, number eight, Rob McElney has disappeared from the leaderboard. So it looks as though that funny sort of problem he had with his bike has proved to be terminal. He's obviously broken down. I was saying earlier that they don't generally break down, but certainly Rob Mack has gone from the proceedings. But now the bunch has really tightened up in second, third and fourth place. And John Reynolds will now have to exercise all the cool. And there's Rob McElney coasting across the track. Steve, any ideas? Yeah, I think he's still got brake problems. Uh, I think he's just overshot at the chicane and uh, that's been his problem for the day. He's a big guy, Rob, but he's uh, very hard on the brakes and he's encountered these problems throughout training. So something's gonna be have to be looked at there. Well, as I was saying, John Reynolds is going to have to call on all his reserves of tact, diplomacy and common sense because breathing down his neck is one of the fastest men round Donington. And breathing down the neck of him is the bloke who just picked him in the first leg. So he's got hot talent behind him. Further down the order, James Whittam in eighth place having a fairly lonely ride and could see the pack disappearing into the s's yeah once again jamie Whitton seems to find himself a nice big open space every time we come to him there's no one in front of him so it's possible that uh, that there's a few much closer behind but out in front he has a clear track but uh, he's out of touch with the leaders unfortunately but still lapping at very respectable times and you see the angle of the lean of the machine as it goes around the Melbourne loop, accelerating hard up to Goddard's corner. You'll see him put the brakes on in a minute. The front end of the machine will dip as he throws it into Goddard's left-hander as they come round to start the another lap on the start and finish line. Well, it's a pity, really, because James Whittam, the man with whom we were just travelling, is right off the back of the leading seven. If he can only close on Carl Fogarty, he might get a toe and get in the thick of the action up front because it really is all happening. Here's the race leader, number one, Terry Reimer from Barnhurst in South London. Then it's Ron Haslam in second place, who doesn't look as though he's going to be able to do anything about the win, but if he can get the satisfaction of beating Neil McKenzie in this leg, then I'm quite sure he'll settle for that. 20, Ron Haslam then in second. And I've just had confirmation that Rob McAuley on the Loctite Yamaha has had front brake problems, and that's the reason he's retired, so that's... Unfortunate for Rob McElnay. Carl Fogarty is still very much in touch. Morrison, Nation, Mackenzie, Reynolds and Haslam. But the gap, six seconds, that's a formidable task at this stage into the race. 
and Reimer is riding the race of a lifetime. Remember, he is the reigning Super Cup champion and would be possibly at the head of the bunch had he contested the Snetterton meeting, but he was away elsewhere in the world doing other things for the Yamaha team. Mackenzie closing Haslam down dramatically on the brakes, underlining yet again just how vital the braking mechanism here is at Donington. It's a very fast track, but equally there are some very tight bends. Yes, and, and fast straights leading onto them. There's points where they're braking from 160 miles an hour. Uh, one Pacific point is into the S's down to maybe 50 miles an hour. That deacceleration time is so small that you can see as Ron on the brakes are on there, the bike becomes very light on the back. The, the whole machine tries to pivot around the front wheel as you put those six pot caliper brakes on. And it really is very strenuous on the, on the brakes and the discs. Reimer just stretching that advantage now. He's put a couple of tail enders between himself and Ron Haslam. Ron Haslam seems to have slipped off the pace just a little bit because right with him now is Neil McKenzie. And McKenzie's already demonstrated. As number 36 gets lapped there, that's Mark Livingston, the RAF rider. Number seven off in the gravel trap, that's Ian Simpson from Dalbiti. So the young Scott, who was in fact a member of the Mick Grant Suzuki team a couple of years ago, now sponsored by Francis Williamson, I believe, out of the reckoning. He was in 10th place, so that's bad news. Six points in the gravel. Yeah, it's a shame. And, and the problem with that gravel is that uh, it gets in the motorcycles everywhere. It does a great job at stopping you and saving you sliding, but it, uh, the whole motorcycle needs taken apart once it's put in that gravel trap to strip every part, particle out. Just look at the battle now between these two. Haslam feeding the power in. That's the problem with the Norton. It's such a torquey engine. It really screws the power out of the rear tyre. And quite easily, the back could step out. He has a job keeping the front down when he puts the power on. Coming onto the straight and a big wiggle there as I spoke. But they are a long way now behind Terry Reimer. Eight seconds is the gap. Uh, Steve, it's a lifetime, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think somebody needs to tell Terry Reimer to slow down because consistently he's putting in the fastest lap. He's down to 137.56, which is coming close to lap record times. And uh, there really doesn't seem to be any need for it. He has a very, very comfortable lead. But the problem is, and a rider has, if you, try, if you give them signals to slow down, it's so easy to lose concentration. Our old friend Kevin Schwartz has done this in the past in the 500 GPs, fell off while leading a race, which can be highly embarrassing and also quite painful. I'm watching with a great deal of interest Haslam's teammate, number three, Trevor Nation, because he's pulled out just a little bit extra from his Norton and he's tagged himself on the back end of Neil McKenzie. They're not letting the Scott go by any manner of means. They really are putting him under pressure. And he's well and truly in between those two Nortons. Haslam, however, still every bit as fast as the rest of them. Second place, number 20, Ron Haslam. Then still McKenzie. There's Nation, number three. Hinkley in Leicestershire, winner of the Northwest 200 last week in Ireland. Absolutely thrilled with that win. That puts his number of wins in the Northwest to three. He won it in 86, 87, and now again in 91. Nation loves the true road races, hence his appearance each year in the TT. As they come up to the start and finish line, there'll be four laps to go. Trevor Nation will be keen to pass Neil McKenzie. And I think he'd be even keener to pass Ron Haslam. Ron has slightly overshadowed him this uh, here at Donington today because uh, there's always a battle amongst teams. Every team member wants to be the quickest one out there. Ron Haslam does have a little advantage over Trevor in the fact that he's a smaller rider and the frontal area is smaller, he's a bit lighter. And it does make a difference even on these big 750 machines is if you can be light and Throws it around as Neil McKenzie on his favourite spot once again goes through to Ron, passes Ron Haslam as they went down and Haslam looks around the outside but oh, I was about to say there wasn't room for two but Ron Haslam proved me wrong. What a brave man. Rocket Ron, his nickname, and he's certainly living up to that here at Donington. He just illustrated to Neil McKenzie there that it doesn't matter what you do, Neil, if I really want to, I've got a little bit left tucked in my back pocket and he just produced it then and flashed past Neil McKenzie on the outside. That was great. And just look at those three riders closing on the back. 
That is an equally frantic struggle between John Reynolds, Brian Morrison and Carl Fogarty, numbers six, two and nine, respectively. And it's a pity we haven't got eyes everywhere because it's every bit as angry a tussle as the one we're watching now. Reynolds, having led from the start, has been relegated to fifth and won't be best pleased with that. He would have liked to have done just a little bit better, I suspect. Yeah, I don't think Neil McKenzie's done with Ron Haslam yet. He's still got a little bit to show. Uh, he's very, very fast at the old hairpin, down through Craner Calves and round uh, the old hairpin. That's where he seems to be doing all his passing manoeuvres. Let's see if he has a, another crack at Ron Haslam this time. Number 47 retiring there's Colin Gable. So the RC30 Honda of Gable coming in. And just a little update on the 125 saga, if I may. The two riders who fell and were subsequently excluded, numbers two and four, Rob Orr and Robert Dunlop, have both sustained broken collarbones. And that has been confirmed by the officials. So that does indeed put a very big question mark over Robert Dunlop's appearance on the other Norton in the Isle of Man TT. Two weeks isn't very long, and short of an operation with a pin, there is no way that a collarbone would heal within two weeks, Steve. No, it wouldn't heal by uh, uh, under normal conditions, but there is an operation that a lot of riders do have done. They have a plate put in and some screws and uh, become bionic and uh, metal men again. But uh, they, their racing comes first, unfortunately, at times, and they screw themselves back together. The problem with that, of course, is the delay caused when you're going through the check-in security at airports. You send the bleeper off every time. Well, the worst part is having it removed. It's one thing having a plate put in, but when you're all healed up, it's not much fun going in and having the screws taken out. Hence the decision by former world champion uh, Gardner, of course, not to have metal put in his body. He'd rather let it heal naturally. Well, I can't say I blame him for that. Haslam, then, still with Mackenzie and Trevor Nation is looking very determined indeed and I think that maybe Trevor just thinks that he could do something about Neil Mackenzie. The Team Selkaline Honda of Mackenzie's is certainly very, very quick indeed and that's the RC30 Honda, the VFR750 V4 four-stroke. Just look at the lead Reimer has. That's the tail ender. And this is the trio for second, third, and fourth place. It is still Haslam from Mackenzie, from Nation. And I don't see much happening until we get into the last lap, Steve. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. But ha uh, now Terry Reimer does have an incredible lead. Here we are back on bike with Jamie Whitten with the forward facing camera. And he has now someone in his picture. And it's John Reynolds, I believe. Or um, He's in eighth position, it's John Reynolds we're going to see in front. So Jamie Whittam has finally caught someone up. He was having such a lonely ride. So let's see if he can close in on John Reynolds now. In eighth position, Jamie Whittam. So John Reynolds in seventh that we're looking at. And ahead of Reynolds, of course, is Fogarty. So Jamie Whittam has definitely wound the Mick Grant Suzuki up. He's caught on the tail end. And that's what I said. If he could only get them in sight and wind them in a bit, then he might just be able to pull in the rest of the pack but this action here is still closing up it's still nation mckenzie and haslam and i suspect at this time haslam might just be thinking well i wonder what else i have to do to win one of these races i don't know i just keep on trying and they're always there well as they come around now to cross the start and finish line this is the last lap so we're going to see if Neil McKenzie has anything up his sleeve or whether ron haslam's going to be able to keep him at bay or even if trevor nation is going to be able to nip through Coming up now to the point where Neil McKenzie is favourite part on the course through Craner Curves, 120 miles now as they break down into third gear. But no, Ron Haslam's not left him any room whatsoever, so Neil's decided that that won't be his passing place. If we're going to see anything, I think we'll maybe have to wait till they get round through to the S's. Look at the gap. Eight seconds nearly between the race leader and this man, number 20, Ron Haslam, who's in second place. Nothing they can do now about Terry Reimer. 24-year-old Londoner has had a super ride and there he is. What a lonely tour he's having up the straight. They're just coming out of coppice in pursuit. They can see him, but that's about all. That's a tail ender in the front of your picture now. 
number 26, and that's Dave Seagrave. The writer with a very suspect name of Team Spoilt Brat. Well, I leave you to draw, in your own, draw your own conclusions there as they go down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Whatever the team, it certainly doesn't help because look at Nation. Nation McKenzie, it's these two. And then if Nation does manage to get his Norton past Neil McKenzie, what can he do about teammate Ron Haslam? Over the line goes Reimer, a very good 7.50 race, and it's a sprint to the line. Haslam's going to get second with a massive wheelie. Another great wheelie from Nation, and McKenzie got third. Well, the race was all about that second, third, and fourth place, and I suspect quite satisfying for Ron Haslam because he returned the compliment to Neil McKenzie, but they've thrilled the crowd. So, confirmation then of the top six, Terry Reimer from Ron Haslam, nearly seven seconds adrift. Mackenzie just a fraction ahead, in fact, 0.2 of a second from Nation. Brian Morrison, that's a good ride, and Carl Fogarty stayed ahead of Reynolds and Jamie Whittle.